September 25th, 1943. What do you do if you're at war and one of your allies falls? Carry on and do as best as you can without them or declare a war of vengeance on your recent allied forces? If you're the Nazis, you do the latter. This week, forces of the German Wehrmacht goes after the Italian army to slaughter them. This is War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. As you can see, I'm once again in Indy's war room. We just got back from D-Day, and this week we are going to release two episodes for two weeks of War Against Humanity back to back. Last week, we saw the NKVD detain tens of thousands of civilians in the newly liberated territories in Russia. In the US, the suppression of Japanese Americans harshened, the Germans consolidated their power in Albania, and in Greece, the Wehrmacht killed some 500 civilians in the Vianos massacre. Germany's effort to consolidate power in the Balkans continues this week, as do the associated atrocities. The 11,000 soldiers of the Italian 33rd Infantry Division, the Acqui Division, on Cephalonia in the Ionian Sea, commanded by General Antonio Gandin and supported by Greek resistance forces, have been holding out against the German takeover for two weeks now. Their situation has become hopeless after the Wehrmacht sent in detachments of the 1st Mountain Divisions and 140 with Jäger Division. Gandin, well connected within the Wehrmacht command, wants to surrender. His men, knowing that they will become German POW, do not. Gandin concedes and they prepare for direct confrontation, which comes when the Germans attack from sea and on land. By September 22nd, the Italians have lost 1,315 men against 300 German soldiers and the Italians surrender. Now, Back on the 13th, German Führer Adolf Hitler ordered that for all parts of the Italian units which allowed weapons to fall in the hands of partisans or worked with partisans, the following treatment is provided. 1. The officers will be executed according to military law. 2. NCOs and soldiers will be immediately transported to the East for forced labor. They will be dealt as prisoners of war. On Cephalonia, the German command sees it yet harsher. They argue that they had effective operational control over the Italian forces as soon as Italy surrendered. By that argument, the Italian soldiers are Wehrmacht soldiers, and thus mutineers, who following martial law should be executed. On September 24th, the entire Italian leadership of the Acqui Division is summarily tried and executed. General Antonio Gandin and 137 of his most senior officers are shot, their bodies thrown in the sea. As the ordinary soldiers are disarmed, they are executed en masse. Some on the spot where they surrender, while others are assembled and lined up to be executed in small groups. Some soldiers are made to lie down to be shot through their heads, while others are strafed by machine gun fire. Italian chaplain Romualdo Formato is left alive and witnesses men hugging each other, singing and praying as they are mowed down. In another instance, Formato recalls how some German Wehrmacht soldiers promised to spare the survivors of an erratic shooting incident. As around 20 survivors crawl out of the tangle of their comrades' dead bodies, the Germans open fire again. Up to 5,000 Italian soldiers and officers are murdered. Some bodies are cremated, others thrown in the sea or left to rot in the streets as a warning to the Greek civilians. Some Italians manage to escape or join the Greek partisans. Others will be used as slave laborers on Cephalonia by the new German occupation forces. A few thousand are loaded on passenger ships to be taken to mainland camps. Hitler has ordered to forego all safety precautions during the transport of prisoners, regardless of losses. Consequently, the transports on Simfra and Ardena end with the ships striking Allied mines, adding up to 3,000 Italian dead as the ships go down. By their own word, the Wehrmacht is acting in vengeance, using Hitler's kill order as a cover. Captain Sigvard Göller writes, On the island of Cefalonio in Corfu, the Italians resisted and believed in their irrational blinding and their so characteristic arrogance of idiots that they were about to change the course of history. Everything that our comrades in arms were forced to suffer beyond Africa and Sicily because of their betrayal burnt us. And we hit them. We hit them as we never hit anybody else in this war. Yes, Cefalonia and Corfu. 
After the Acquis division is done in, the German troops move to Corfu on September 24th, where they capture 8,000 Italians, killing at least 23 officers, by some accounts all 280. The captured men will suffer the same fate as the survivors at Cephalonia, slavery. Similar scenes play out on Kos. If the Germans think that these massacres are discouraging resistance, they are sorely mistaken, though. Partisan activity is on the rise across the Balkans. In Slovenia, the communist partisans have not only been fighting the Italian occupiers, but also the Slovene Chetniks and anti-communist volunteer militia, MVAC, who had allied with the Italians in the hope that this would be a path to eventually reform an independent non-communist Yugoslavia. Under Italian protection, they were able to oppose the partisans in force. Now, with Italy gone and Germany not yet in place, the Chetniks hope for reinforcements from Croatia, and MVAC even hopes to be acknowledged by the Allied forces as the legitimate rulers of Slovenia. But all that doesn't happen. As the Slovenian nationalist forces move south towards the coast, they are pushed back by partisan troops and end up taking refuge in Turjak Castle, just south of Ljubljana. The partisans are reinforced with fresh Italian recruits who have switched sides, bringing with them some of their artillery and tanks. For roughly one week, they besiege Turja Castle. On September 19th, the MVAC and Chetnik forces surrender, and roughly 1,200 men are taken prisoners. At least 115 MVAC and Chetnik fighters are summarily sentenced to death. This is the end of MVAC and of the Slovene Chetniks. Many of those not killed have switched sides and joined the partisans. The remaining forces are disbanded or disarmed by the German forces. This gives way for the partisans, who move into large areas of southeastern Slovenia and northern Croatia, declaring the areas as being liberated and installing some of their own regime. The victory is short-lived, though, as on September 25th, the Germans move in to retake the Slovenian coastline around Trieste and Istria. Further north, the Germans terminate another operation. The liquidation of the Vilna Ghetto. Many of the original 57,000 forced into the ghetto have already been murdered or have been abducted to work in labor camps in occupied Estonia. Jakob Gens, leader of the Jewish ghetto government, was murdered by the Gestapo on the 14th and this week, on September 23rd and 24th, the last 12,000 inhabitants leave the ghetto. About 3,700 people are deemed to still be exploitable and sent into slavery in occupied Estonia and Latvia. Some 1,300 are deemed too sick or too old to be transported and taken to the Ponary Fort outside of town. There they are shot. The remaining 4,000 mainly elderly women and children are put on trains to Sobibor Extermination Factory. None of them will survive the war and there are no accounts of their last moments. They were among the few people of Jewish faith, ethnicity, or origin who had survived in occupied Eastern Europe beyond 1942. In Western Europe and among the Axis allies, the situation has been somewhat different. However, in February this year, the Reichsaußenministerium, the Reich Foreign Office, determined that Jews from all occupied countries, as well as German allies Romania and Bulgaria, should be included in any measures generally made against Jews or in such measures yet to be made. But Jewish people originating from Italy, Finland, Switzerland, Spain, Portugal, Denmark, and Sweden should be given the opportunity to return to their country of origin. Ernst Kaltenbrunner, Reinhard Heydrich's replacement as head of the SS Reichssicherheitshauptamt, set a deadline for when that would no longer apply, July 31st, 1943. This week, on September 23rd, Kaltenbrunner orders the deportation of all Jews in occupied territory regardless of nationality. Foreign Jews from aforementioned countries will go to Buchenwald and Ravensbrück concentration camps, while Jewish people of other nationalities, or living in their own country of citizenship, will face the usual selection for death by labor or immediate murder. It's an escalation that puts Jewish people until now kept safe by their nationality in immediate danger, like in Belgium. Here, bureaucrats and some leading members of the clergy, like Cardinal Josef Ernest von Roy, have managed to keep the Nazis at bay. Heinrich Himmler ordered an end to that already in July, but the order is only enacted now in September, with combing actions in Brussels and Antwerp resulting in the arrest of several thousand Belgian Jews. On September 20th, 800 of them are put on Transport 12B. 
Chaim Vidal Sefia, a Turkish-Belgian Jew, is among them. We were herded into the freight cars the evening before our departure. Our luggage was placed in a special car at the end of the train. Later, I learned that this car had been detached from the train somewhere in Germany and its contents were presented to the German population as a gift from the Belgian nation. In Mechelen, we were asked by the Nazis to write to our extended family and friends for material support such as food, clothes, boots, and furs. The Nazis knew where these items would eventually be distributed, but we had no idea neither of what they were doing with us nor with our luggage and why it was put into a separate carriage. Before departure, Commander Frank spoke about the work that was awaiting us in the east, and we believed it. I occupied the space behind the latrine in a corner where there was a skylight with barbed wire. I was the one servicing the toilet, meaning I had to empty the bucket, but at least I had fresh air. Two days later, on September 22nd, they arrive at the Auschwitz-Birkenau. More than half are told to assemble in a line which will take them straight to the gas chambers and cremation ovens. The remainder are selected to be killed through forced labor. Of the 800 people on Transport 12B, only 19 will survive the war. Among them is Haim Vidal Sefia. Nobody had a clue that about half of us would be immediately annihilated upon arrival. Once in Auschwitz, I personally thought I had just entered a universe of maniacs meeting men in their striped pajamas who were constantly hitting their shoulders in order to beat the cold was like experiencing a hallucination they would ask us if we had sisters and brothers in the camp and when we nodded in the affirmative they would point to a smoking chimney and say this is where they are now nobody believed it in denmark there are roughly 8000 men women and children who face a similar fate now that the german occupation has been made into a military dictatorship the German occupation suffers from some complications, though. On paper, it is led by General Hermann von Hanneken and the Wehrmacht. But three years of lenient occupation and support of the now dissolved Danish military to keep national order has left the Wehrmacht willfully unprepared to take active charge. Despite Hitler's orders to use force, they continue to rely on diplomacy in cooperation with the Reichsaußenministerium. At its head in Denmark is Werner Best, a complex character with a long Nazi career behind him. He was instrumental in creating the organization in charge of the German genocide, the SS Reichssicherheitshauptamt, together with its late leader Heydrich in the mid-1930s. It was Best who made Heydrich's idea of Einsatzgruppen a practical operation. He also authored literature guiding the operations of the Gestapo, supported the integration of German regular police forces as muscle for the SS operations, and helped implement the increasingly suppressive persecution of German Jews. When the war began, he found himself in conflict with his boss Heydrich over how to best administrate occupied Poland. Best advocated a less direct approach, based on putting local Nazi sympathizers in power and letting them take care of ethnic and ideological cleansing. With Reichsführer SS firmly on the side of Heydrich's policy in carrying out mass murders and deportations in direct SS operations, Best tried to bypass them by appealing directly to Hitler, who sided with Himmler and Heydrich. Best then left the Reichssicherheitshauptamt and volunteered for the Wehrmacht in early 1940. When France fell to the Nazis, he became part of the German military occupation power. As one of the main coordinators with the French collaborationist government in Vichy, Best was instrumental in ensuring that the French took an active role in the first internments and deportations of French and foreign nationals of Jewish ethnicity. After France was annexed into full occupation last year, 1942, Best was sent to Denmark to repeat the same here. In the past months, he has managed to create a more or less complete register of Danes and foreigners of Jewish ethnicity in the country and gained some confidence among the Danish administration. When Hitler ordered the military dictatorship this August, Best was opposed, believing that he could still ply out a cooperative client state. By his own admission, the recent failures the German war effort has seen left him even more reluctant to use excessive force against potential future allies. 
As Best had predicted, Danish protests and active resistance has risen dramatically in the past weeks. In an effort to gain control of the escalating situation, Best convinced Himmler to give him control of the Reichssicherheitshauptamt in Denmark, in addition to an expanded role of the Foreign Office that he is de facto already in charge of. A week ago, his effort fell apart, as the SS and Foreign Office both fear losing control to the other. He has gotten his expanded role and been promoted within the SS to Obergruppenführer, but another SS Obergruppenführer, Günther Panke, is the new higher leader of the SS and police in Denmark. Panke immediately starts shipping in additional SS police forces from occupied Norway and sets out to begin the deportation of all Jews in Denmark on October 2nd. Best is informed of Panke's plan on September 18th. Now, seven days later, Best's lists and his office are guiding Panka's operations. And so ends another week in the war against humanity with yet more dead and yet more people marked for death. It would take a miracle to save the Jews in Denmark before their fate is sealed less than a week from now. But perhaps it is time for us to believe in such miracles, because as the confused attempts of the German Nazis to rule Denmark shows, the once pristine dark armor of the Nazi forces has been scuffed, bumped, and scratched, perhaps to the point that it will in some places soon crack. Next week we will see if that place is Denmark. Never forget.